at the Opera House, to be here in this room. This is a space without judgment. All of us are deeply crazy. Oh, please. Human nature is not that great. My life is a lie. Oh. We all have the right to release yourself from bullshit jobs. There's lots of life. Yeah, I'm still standing. Welcome to the Sydney Opera House for the Antidote Festival. My name is Faustina Agoli. It's so great to see you all here. Thank you for taking the time, for um, paying money for a ticket to be here in the audience. And thank you to everybody who's, who's watching through the live stream right now, wherever you are in the world. It's great to see you. And if you have your, your phones on you and if they work in the house um, and you want to join in on the online conversation, make sure you hashtag Antidote. We're in for a treat today. We're going to hear from DeRay McKesson which is going to be very, very exciting. Now, DeRay rose to prominence five years ago. Spurred by the death of Mike Brown, McKesson stood with hundreds on the streets of Ferguson, Missouri, for 400 days to bring to life the Black Lives Matter movement. His book, On the Other Side of Freedom, The Case for Hope, is a bright conversation about resistance and justice built from his activism. And his work on his podcast, Pod Save the People, is a weekly discussion on the continued work that needs to be done. Please welcome to the Sydney Opera House, DeRay McKesson. Oh, 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 oh. Thank you. It is an honor to be here today. It is five years since the protest began in Ferguson, Missouri, on August 9, 2014, when the police killed Michael Brown Jr. and left his body in the street for four and a half hours. It has been a long five years. We stood in the street for 400 days. In the early days of the protest, it was a long 400 days. If you ever saw us in the street, it wasn't that we thought marching was cool. It was actually illegal to stand still. In August, September, and October of 2014, if we stood still for more than five seconds, we were arrested. I think about that often because it was a reminder for me of how fragile freedom is. I was arrested twice, and I tell you that not as a badge of honor, but because it was real. It has been a long five years. My phone has been hacked, uh, just like Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, his phone got hacked the other day. My phone got hacked just like that. Um, a movie theater was evacuated because somebody said they were gonna kill me. The first person ever permanently banned from Twitter was banned for raising money to try and get me killed. And it has been, like I said, a long five years. 
But the thing that animated us in the street were a commitment and a belief about a set of ideas. I wanna talk about some of those ideas today. And the first is this idea of safety beyond policing. We were always trying to help people understand and decouple the idea of what it means to be safe in the presence of police. We would ask people, if you close your eyes right now and imagine the place where you feel the most safe, it's probably not a room full of police. It's probably a room where there's food, shelter, love, resources. That is real. We also will remind people that the police often get there after the bad things already happen, and we want to live in a world where the bad things don't happen in the first place. The second is this idea of abolition. Most people have heard about the idea of abolition, and most people think about it as the end of prisons and jails. And that is a part of it. But abolition is not only an idea, but it's possible. And when we think about abolition, we think about it not only as the end of prisons and jails, but the end of the conditions that lead to prisons and jails. So abolition is as much about the end of prisons and jails as it is about the end of addiction, the end of poverty, the end of hunger, these things that lead people to believe that putting people in cages is actually the best idea. And the third is sometimes we say the system is broken, and it is broken. And people say, oh, no, it was designed to be like that. And our takeaway is that it was designed, that people made it up because people made it up, we can make something better. So when we hear the system is broken, we are always mindful that it doesn't have to be. Now, I used to teach sixth grade math, which is the best grade ever. Sixth grade is 11-year-olds. 11-year-olds are great. 12-year-olds, a little tough. Uh, seventh grade, 12-year-olds is deodorant in puberty, and it is a nightmare, you know? <laughs> but sixth grade is like still a little magic. Like I could walk in a class and be like, are you ready to be a math magician? And they're like, yes. And I'm like, oh, this is great. Uh, I used to teach 60, 90, and 120 minutes of math, which is a lot of math for anybody, adults and definitely 11 year olds. And one day my students were like, can we go to gym early? Because I had them for 100 minutes. So I'm like, you can go to gym. And gym was already questionable because the science teacher was also the gym teacher. And I love him. He's like one of my best friends. But like, Great science teacher, questionable gym teacher. So uh, <laughs> I send them to gym, and they come back really quick. And I'm like, why are y'all back so quick? I, I thought you wanted to go to gym. And what I realize is that they're in love with the idea of gym more than the work of gym. <laughs> and I say that because in this moment at home, I think there are a lot of people more in love with the idea of resistance than the work of resistance. So what I want to talk to you. <laughs> What I want to talk to you about is what do we know about the work today that we didn't know in 2014? Now, some of it is sobering, that the police have actually killed more people since the protests began, not less. That a lot of people think that because the protests have garnered so much attention, because people are talking about the police more, that something must have changed in a positive way with regard to the outcomes. They haven't. And I say this because we're mindful to never confuse a change in conversation with a change in outcomes. That we are talking about the world and mass incarceration, prisons, the police in ways that we've never done in public. The outcomes actually haven't matched the pace of the conversation. We say this not because we don't think we can win, but because we remember that the conversation is not the same thing as the outcomes. This is also the first year ever where black people are more afraid of being killed by a police officer than being killed by community violence. We never thought that that would happen. And a third of all the people killed by strangers actually killed by a police officer in the United States. I say that because sometimes people say to me, they're like, you're being dramatic. And I'm like, the truth is dramatic. That all I'm doing is telling you what's happening. Some people say to me, you're making this about race. And I'm like, race made this about me that we are actually just helping to translate to the public what is really happening in people's lives and communities and at scale. Now, of the lessons, uh, the first thing that I'll tell you is that when we ask people what percent of arrests happen for violent crime, people often think of a big number, but it's actually 5%. Of all the arrests that happen in the United States for violent crime, it is 5% of the arrests happen for violent crime. It's not a lot. And you think about 5%, less than 5% is actually convictions. So you think about, like, people want to believe that all this violence is happening in communities. Not actually true. I'll ask you the next question. Raise your hand if you've heard of private prisons before. Like, you've heard of, like, the presence of private prisons? Okay. Now, what percent of people who are incarcerated do you think is in a private prison? We'll vote. You'll raise your hand again. So if you think that it is more than 70%, raise your hand. 60 to 70%? I get nervous with this because I was a math teacher, but not a calculator, okay. Uh, 40 to 50%, 30 to 40%, 20 to 30%, uh, less than 20%, it is 8%. 
It's also much lower than people think. And I say this because the first idea I want to communicate is this idea that we, actually, we actively dispel myths, that part of our work is actually myth-busting, that a lot of people think that most of the arrests happen for violent crime. If you believe that, people are more likely to believe that putting people in cages actually has a positive impact. And the thing about private prisons is if you believe that most people are incarcerated in a private prison, then you're more likely to let the government off the hook because it's not the government doing the bad thing. It's like these random companies. But the reality is like the government is actually perpetrating most of the harm that is happening to people. And remember, the end of private prisons, they're still in prison, they're just not in a private one. So it is an issue, but it's not what people think it is. The privatization of services in prison is much bigger. So we charge people for phone calls. Every time I email Josh, who's somebody who's incarcerated, Every single time I email him, I have to buy an electronic stamp. I didn't even know electronic stamps were a thing. Uh, so we talk about private prisons and we talk about the arrest rate because we remind people that the first thing that we do is actively dispel myths. The second is that we understand truth and reconciliation. And the big thing here is that we understand that the truth has to come before the reconciliation. There are a lot of people who want to do all the reconciliation work without dealing with the truth first. I was at a party, and this is not a humble brag, but I was at uh, Beyonce, Beyonce's mom, Miss Tina. Uh, <laughs> Miss Tina has a party every year called the Wearable Art Gala. And at the Wearable Art Gala, you wear a piece of art. So I'm wearing this like plastic coat that has these facts on it, all the facts are true. Uh, the first is that we arrest more people for weed than all violent crimes combined, and that's after legalization. And one of the facts is that white high school dropouts have more wealth than all black college graduates, also true. So I have these facts on, and this, this record exec comes up to me, he's like, Dre, you are wearing an interesting jacket. And I'm like, I don't think it's, in like, interesting isn't the word I'd use. And he's like, um, he's like, is this true? And I'm like, yeah, why would I wear fake facts to a party, right? Like, that is weird. <laughs> So then he's like, well, let's talk about the wealth one. And I'm like, you know, this, he's like, well, I don't think that's true. And I'm like, mm, it, like, you don't get to not, this is true, right? This is it. <laughs> and he's like, well, you know, the reason that white people have more wealth than black people is that there are more white people. And I was like, <laughs> but we're at this party, so I can only be but so crazy because like we're at a party. So I go, you know, the only reason there are more white people is that you killed half the people and enslaved the other half. <laughs> and he is like, and he's like, well, I don't know. I'm like, you don't get not to know. That like happened, right? Like this is real. Uh, but it was a reminder that we actually have to make people deal with what is true and what is not true, no matter where we are. That one of the things we think about often is this idea that we take the truth with us into every room. And there are a lot of people who would take the truth everywhere, but with their friends, that take the truth everywhere, but to a party, that people like take the truth in these interesting places, but don't always take it where it's needed. I'll never forget meeting with President Obama. We met with him twice, the longest meeting he ever had in the White House that wasn't dedicated to national security was with us, it was four hours. Uh, and in that meeting, there were all these civil rights leaders. And one of the things I'll never forget is that people said a lot of things, they didn't always bring the truth with them. A lot of the oldest civil rights leaders brought their ego, they brought their resumes, they did not bring the truth. And what we would say is that the truth always has to come with you when you do this work. That the truth has to be at the dinner table, it has to be at the boardroom, it has to be at work. That the truth part of truth and reconciliation is actually the key. The next is this idea that we never let the system off the hook, that part of our work is always to fight about the system, that in 2014, we probably would have told you that this is about better people, that we need better police chiefs, better mayors, better city council members. Now we know that we need a system that works whether the people are good or bad, that the structure actually has to make sense, that people like programs, and programs are interesting, but most programs exist because the system failed in the first place. So the only reason why we need to feed homeless people under the bridge is that we've allowed homelessness to flourish. The only reason why we need a million after-school programs to teach kids how to read and write is because the school system failed to do it in the first place. That programs are important, but the system has to be the level that we fight at. Now, I'll show you this because people often think that they are not smart enough to understand the way the system works. That often we tell stories about people's lives and things like that to sort of gloss over the fact that systems actually have a big part to play. I'll let you read this. Does this make sense? No. You don't need a PhD, you don't need to be an elected official to realize that like this is probably a problem for a host of reasons. I'll let you read this next one. We just copied and pasted. Does this make sense? You don't need a PhD to be like, I don't even know what least likely to embarrass means. Like I don't even, I don't know what that means. There are two cities in America that have this. 
I say this because part of our work was figuring out, and we were trying to understand, like, why do the police never get convicted or charged or indicted? And we realized that there's, there's actually a system of policies, practices, and laws that almost guarantee the police won't be held accountable. In California, the biggest state, the state that also kills more people by the police in any state, there's a law that says that any investigation of an officer that lasts more than a year can never result in discipline, regardless of the outcome. That doesn't make sense. In Oregon, officers can use deadly force if you engage in escape in the first degree. Escape in the first degree is running. That also doesn't make sense. That part of our work is to remind everybody that you are smart enough to understand the way that systems work. That part of the status quo is to convince you that you needed somebody to interpret the system for you. You are smart enough to understand this on your own. Now, you might have heard our forever first lady, Michelle Obama, say this. When they go low, we go high. And we believe that. People have misunderstood this, though, to be a statement about pacifism. But this is actually a statement about fighting. That when they go low, we go high is a reminder that when they go low, we go high back to our convictions, our calling, and our values. This means that we fight harder than we've ever fought before because we hold dear the things that we believe in the most. And when they go low, especially at home, and you know our president is a little... It's rough, right? Uh, when they go low at home, it is often about fear. They're using fear to get you to act out of character. And we always talk about the things that we can convince you to believe if we make you afraid. All of the work on immigration at home right now that Trump is doing is about making people fear immigrants. And what we would say again is that, like, remember all the things that we can convince you to believe that you'd never believe were you not afraid. And what we tell people is this notion that when you are afraid for the people that you love, you hold them close to you. You don't push them away. And it's the same thing about our values. When people try to put fear into the space, you hold on to your values closer than you've ever held on to them. When people put fear into the space, you hold on to your belief in community. You hold on to your belief in a radical love that can change the world. You hold on to your belief that truth has to be present to all the rooms. So when they go low, we go high. It's not about pacifism. It is about the good fight. It is about fighting in ways that you have never fought before. It is something that we're trying to get the Democrats to understand at home. But it is this thing that like you fight, you fight, you fight when you go high. Now, we also tell stories that part of our work is telling stories that we believe that we can't fight for what we can't imagine. That part of our work is to tell a story about a world that we've never seen before, but we know it's possible. We have never lived in a world where every kid can have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, but we know that world is possible. We've never lived in a world where every kid can read and write, but we know that world is possible. We've never lived in a world where everybody has shelter, but we believe in that world too. Part of our work is to speak that world into existence. We are reminded that God spoke to the prophets in dreams, and people always laugh at the dreamers, partly because they know that there is power in the act of imagination. That part of our work is to dream the world that we can fight for because we know that it is possible. We are storytellers. Now, this is one that I hold dear to me, is that the act of definition is one of the most powerful acts that we have. What is a border but a definition? that part of our work is defining the terms. I'll define a few with you today. One is the idea of equality and equity. People use them interchangeably, but they are not the same. Equality is the idea that everybody gets the same thing. Equity is that people get what they need and deserve, and the work of justice is almost always the work of equity. That when we think about funding for school systems, we are never asking for equal funding. We're always asking for equitable funding because we know it costs more to educate kids in poverty and kids with special needs. That the justice work is about equity that can set you up later for equality, but equity is something different. We think about diversity and inclusion, that diversity is often about bodies, inclusion is about culture. You can hire 20 more black people and still be a racist company. You can have 15 more trans members of the community and still be a transphobic place. That people have done a lot of work on the body work and have done almost no work on the culture work. And this is about punishment and consequence, that people often use these interchangeably, but they are not the same. That punishment is about pain and consequence is about change. I used to teach sixth grade math, and let me tell you, there were some times where like, you just had to go. It was like you were having a tantrum or like something's going on. You just, we couldn't be in the same room right now. But sending a kid to the office, sending them to the guidance counselor, having them take a timeout was not the same thing as locking them in the closet. Locking them in the closet is punishment. A consequence is saying you need to go get yourself together. We can believe that some people need to be separated from society without believing that they need to be locked in cages. And we remind people that punishment and consequences are not the same. And the last, I will leave this part of tonight uh, with a chant that brought us to the street in the beginning. This is one of the chants that animated us from the early days, no justice, no peace. 
It is a chant that we said every night. It is a chant that people still say all over the world, no justice, no peace. I'll ask you to say it after me, no justice, no, justice. no, peace. no peace. It is something that we believe so dearly that some people understood this as a threat, but we understood it as a statement of fact that any call for peace not rooted in a demand for justice was something that we didn't want. We knew that any call for peace not rooted in a demand for justice was just a desire for order and control. And we knew that the freedom that our lives deserve was something deeper than order and control. We wanted a justice that we could feel and touch and see and hear. We wanted justice, it says Tamir Rice, who was a 12-year-old killed by the police in Cleveland, that he's coming home today. We wanted justice, it says Rakia Boyd, who was killed at a cookout, gets to be with her family again. Or justice says Mike Brown, who was killed crossing the street by his grandmother's house, gets to cross another street. We want a justice made real. We don't want an abstract justice. We don't want something that we can read. We want something that we can feel and touch and see and hear. We want to know justice. We want to know peace. It is an honor to be here today. Thank you. I need to just like wipe my face. It is so hot. So like a, do you have something I can wipe my face with? <laughs> that light hot. is hot. I'm like, I was like, I mean, I wear a vest every day, so like, it's, all, it's already <laughs> hot, but okay. That was an incredible speech. Thank you Thank so you. much. Deray, there's so much to talk about in this session, um, but I think I'll wind back to the roots and your upbringing um, first. Um, what compelled you to, because it seems that from my research, you've, you've always been involved in community organizations and especially a, a deep alignment with education. Where did that come from? Was it your dad? I think, uh, so me and my sister both, my sister's name is Tere, we're not twins, we just have rhyming names. And um, we both grew up and became middle school math teachers, completely random. Really? Yes, yeah, super wow. random. She taught eighth grade, I taught sixth grade. And she's now a principal in elementary school. Uh, the first day of school was the other day, very cool. Uh, I send her, you know, it's funny, sometimes I, this is a random tangent, but sometimes I'll send her like random gifts to school just because, you know, everybody loves a surprise. And one day I sent like a bouquet of balloons and she calls and she's like, do not ever send me balloons. The janitors hate me. And I was like, what happened? And like the balloons are like stuck in the ceiling and the janitors want to kill me. I was like, sorry about that, I forgot. Um, but no, I don't know. I, I think that I, I, be, I worked as a community organizer as a teenager. And then teaching really changed my life. It was like one of the hardest things I've ever done. I was a very good teacher. And I say that proudly because I was not always a very good teacher. I taught this lesson on dividing decimals. That was literally the worst thing I've ever done in my life. It was really <laughs> bad. And I had to get much better after that. Most of you probably don't know how to divide a decimal, but I don't. Is, yeah, see? Yep. Hard thing to teach. Uh, so yeah, teaching changed my life. So when I got involved, it literally was like the police killed a teenager. That was it. It was like the police killed a teenager. And the least I could do was go for the weekend. So I was like, I'm gonna go for the weekend. Second night I was in St. Louis was the first night that I was tear gassed. And I was like, I'll make sure, I'll do whatever I can to make sure that nobody else has to experience this. Because you were so shocked about that. You couldn't believe that these sort of tactics were being deployed in a protest movement at, at this time. Yeah, that like we had seen, we had seen in the 60s, we'd seen videos of the 60s where like there were water cannons. Uh, we'd seen dogs sicked on dogs. people. Like we'd seen all that stuff, but we were like, that doesn't happen anymore. Like that was sort of our take. And then they put a curfew in at midnight at eight o'clock, they start shooting tear gas. And we were like, hold up, we didn't even do it. Like not that tear gas would have been warranted if we had done something, but we hadn't done anything. And it was like, this is wild. So we were like, we will fight every day. Because they were being aggressive when you were trying to do a peaceful protest, it seems. Yeah, and we remind people all the time that like the violence of the police is what got us in the street. It wasn't like we didn't start this, right? Like if you yeah. hadn't killed him, we wouldn't be here in the first place. So people, I'd be on the news and people were like, DeRay, talk to me about the violence. I'm like, I can talk to you about it. The police are killing people. And they're like, DeRay, but what about the protesters burning that building down? I'm like, you know, wouldn't have been outside if you hadn't killed somebody. And like always sort of pushing uh, that like, we wouldn't be out here if y'all hadn't done this, you know? They're the aggressors, yes. Uh, and what of the news outlets, because there were plenty of news outlets that reported incorrectly, but who did you have faith in? I think you acknowledged some of them at the end of the book. Yeah, there were a set of uh, reporters who were great. So Wesley Lowry at the Washington Post, Ryan Riley at Huffington Post, Yamish, who is now a White House reporter, but she was at... Um, she was at USA Today, so there were some, but Twitter really helped us. Twitter really saved our life. It was like one of those things that we were able to push back on the dominant culture narratives in a really 
cool way. And I did a lot of press in the early days and it was, you know, I was like the chief defender of the protest. And there were some things I did that I'm like, you know, when you say something, you're like, hope that works, uh, is that there was one night where there were like fist fights at, a, at one of the protests outside of the Ferguson Police Department. It was like the anniversary of something. So all these news cameras were there. So mm. protesters are fighting each other and the news has like HD quality footage of it. So I get on the news the next day and they don't tell me they're gonna talk about this. They tell me something else. So I get on and they are like, she has some random question. And then she's like, Duray, you told me this was nonviolent. And then it pans to like fist fights. And I'm like, this is awkward. And, uh, <laughs> And I thought that she might ask me, so I look at the camera and I go, me and my sister fought all the time as kids and I never questioned my love for her. And I just smile. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, okay. And I'm like, whew, you know, you're like, <laughs> like if she had said anything but okay, I would have been like, bah, bah, what's a fist? You know, I would have been, <laughs> <laughs> it would have been a real rough. Uh, but it was this interesting, like, I was always on defense. So, like, in Baltimore, where Freddie Gray got killed, Freddie Gray, if you remember, he was not strapped into the back of the police, like, van. So his body ping-ponged in the van. His spine was broken in the process. Yeah. He dies. And uh, during the protests, there were, there was all this property damage. So I give them the news, and they're like, Teray, you keep telling me this is not violent. And it, like, pans to a burning building. And I'm like, broken windows are not the same thing as broken spines. And we just sort of believe it, right? And so much of the beginning was like, how can I say something that is like repeatable, that is like tight, mm. that like my, I always am trying to figure out how to talk to my aunt. Like my aunt is who I'm trying to convince. I'm not trying to convince the people on TV. I'm like, if my aunt will repeat this, then I'm winning. You know, like that is my... That's your tactic. And okay. my aunt, she's, she's like, broken windows, broken spines. I'm like, yes, Aunt Me, because she's like, okay. You know, <laughs> that's my, I'm always trying to get to my aunt. That's beautiful. Can we talk about uh, the early days of the BLM movement? And um, people on the street didn't really seem to be that inclusive. You mentioned in the book that there were some homophobic slurs that were hurled your way and to your peers. <laughs> Um, I'd love to get on a granular level with this because I'd love to know how this can apply to us in the work that we do and the spaces that we move in. You mentioned in the book that you had earlier conversations where everybody got together to talk it out and it was very difficult but you got through it. Can you paint a picture of like one of those particular days where it was quite difficult? You know, what is real is that the police, so the Ferguson Police Department is like 50 police officers, it's not big, and there were thousands of us in the street. Mm -hmm. So what they did is that they essentially deputized all of the surrounding counties to, to form like one big police force that was called Unified Command. Uh, so it was to our benefit that they had never worked together before because like they didn't know, they didn't know each other's name, you know, it was like they were a mess and it was, that was really helpful for us. But they were all really wild, it was still like really aggressive. So it was so aggressive that like, we were united partly because like they were just so intense, right? And it was like, so some of the homophobia, and misogyni um, um, misogynistic tendencies were just sort of muted because it was like, well, we might die. So I guess we all are friends today. You know, it was like one of those sort right. of things. And then when it slowed down a little bit, you saw it sort of pop back up and people were just like really, uh, really honest about confronting it. So one of the moments I write about in the book is like, the police are being wild, and this guy walks up to the police, and he is like, you, he calls him a faggot. He's like, you faggot, da da da. And then he turns around, and like, I'm right there, and then another guy's right there. And this guy is like, it happens in like 12 seconds. This guy's like, hey, that was really offensive. Mind you, it's like tear gas is everywhere. And he's like, that was really offensive to me. And the guy's like, I'm so sorry. And you're like, okay. It was like one of those like oh. really beautiful moments that happened in the midst of chaos. And you saw people be open to being pushed in ways that like I never would have imagined. What was hard about the way we built relationships though is that in so many ways, uh, we sort of became friends after the protests ended. We like met, we literally met, like imagine if the police were outside today and we all don't know each other, that we sort of figure out how to work together, but we did that for 400 days. Like, and then the protests end and it's like, this is the first time I'm meeting anybody in your family. I don't know anything about you besides like, if something crazy happens, I know everything about you. You know, I'm like, we know where to run, we know where to hide, we know, but like we didn't know any, we weren't friends for real. So we actually mm. had to build these relationships afterwards that was like a little bit harder than you'd think because our friendships were rooted in battle, you know? Yeah. And when okay. the battle went away, we were like, what do we talk about when we're not getting tear gas? You know, it was like one of those like <laughs> uh, things that we had to learn. 
In the book, you talk about uh, the importance of defining whiteness. Um, and it ties into this recent podcast theme about interrogating the obvious. Can we talk about this and as well as why you don't like the word ally? Yeah, so we think about, so the difference between like an ally and accomplice, an ally loves you from a distance. So an ally is like, hope you get free, got you back, like, <laughs> let me know. An accomplice is like, let me stand with you in this fight. An accomplice is like, let me know what I can risk, let me know what I can put on the line, let me like be there with you. And for white people, that's sort of big because white people have so much less to lose in these battles. So people expect me to talk about the police. When I talk about the police, people are like, okay, Dre's talking about the police. When white people talk about the police, they're like, wow, the police must be an issue. And you're like, yes, they were an issue before. You know, like, so was, or even in the protest, it was like white people put their bodies in the line at the beginning. Mm. And I'll never forget one night, the police had just like body slammed three black people. This older white woman, she had to be like 70. She's out front. She is a protester. And clearly she's not supposed to be in the street. And the police walk up to her and they grab her wrist. They're like, ma'am. And you're like, ma'am, you just, what is this? You're like walking her across the street. Uh, and it was one of those things that was like beautiful to highlight the way race played into it. You know yeah. what I mean? But we think about white supremacy as a smog, right? And part of what that means is that everybody inhales it whether you want to or not. That part of our work is to make sure that people see it when they inhale it and they don't exhale it. Have, yep. What has happened since Ferguson? Because in a recent podcast, um, you spoke to one of the oh, women. Corey. Yeah, 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 Corey, who Corey Bush, who says that not really much has happened on ground. Things have happened in other parts of America, but in Ferguson, nothing has really changed. Yeah, so there's friends on the city council. So there's some, some good stuff, I think, that is like on the horizon. I think the hard part is that, you know, if you think about 2014, people thought there was a crisis in Ferguson. They didn't think there was a crisis in America. Mm. It took us a long time to convince people that this crisis wasn't just confined to one town in one place. I think that... I think that the next work is really like system work. I don't think it's as sexy. It's not, it's not body cameras. It's not implicit bias. It's not more training for people. It really is like, imagine if the worst consequence you had at your job was training, that is the police. So the worst thing they do, they get sent to a training. It's like rape three people, training. You're like, kill these three people, training. You're like, of course nobody's behavior changes when like a training is literally like the most aggressive form of discipline. And we talk to people about implicit bias, like implicit bias is like we can test your bias and train you. Is that it's sort of interesting, but when you think about it, it's like the police go to these implicit bias things, it comes out that they're biased, and then they just go back to work. And you're like, well, that's not helpful. You know, like this is like yeah. a, don't even send them. If, if there's no, if you're not gonna like redeploy them or something based on the data, then like this is just a cool thing that you said you did to like appease the public, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so can we talk about as well the work that you did in that time with political leaders like the, in the Democrats that were vying for presidency? Because I wasn't aware of this kind of work, this detailed work, where you actually sat with Hillary Clinton and, yeah, and Bernie too. Sat with Hillary, sat with Bernie. You know, there's some, we met with Obama a couple of times and uh, the That Obama, didn't produce the outcomes, right? Yeah, the Obama, Obama was interesting. And one of the reasons I'm a little softer on him, even though the Obama White House did literally nothing around the police, not literally, they put out a really cool report, uh, but <laughs> um, they did do a report and Brittany was on the commission. So we liked the commission and we liked the report. After the report, questionable. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm not as hard on him is that I was in those meetings with civil rights leaders and people were just really thank you. They were like, the first thing we had was so awkward because one by one people go around and say what they have to say. You know, we had just, I just gotten arrested, which is like the photo in this book. So I'm upset at the very least. Like I'm like livid in this room, you know? And people are like, thank you so much, President Obama. We're sitting there like, what you thanking him for? He ain't done nothing. Like this, <laughs> and it's so awkward, the first meeting that he literally has to tell people like, please stop saying thank you, let's get to the work. Mm. And I say that because like, he, Obama could walk in right now and be like, nobody pressed me, or like only the protesters pressed me, right? And like, that would be true. Like that wasn't like an untrue statement. Mm -hmm. With Hillary and Bernie, uh, the, like round one, um, Hillary, we met her twice. First meeting, not good. Second meeting, she's great. She's really good on the police, like really good. I think the hard part about the Hillary campaign is that everybody had the same amount of power. So it was like, you're talking to the senior advisor of this person, they tell you one thing. 
the communications director tells you something else. The like special advisor tells you something else. And like everybody was telling you different things. So we met with her and one of our conditions of meeting with her was that we were gonna videotape the meeting because me and Brittany were gonna get so much flack from movement people for only the two of us being in the meeting. But like it was the only meeting we could sneak in before like, you know, so we met with Hillary literally in like, it was like a school, she was gonna give this big talk at a school gym, like a high school gym, and we met with her in like the swing space between the bathroom and like the gym door. So we're like in this tiny random room, you know, it's random. So one of our conditions was that we videotape it. So they sent two videographers, we're like, cool. Hillary is excellent, like so good on the police that we are even shocked. Like we ask her, you know, we're like, we don't think the police need more money for training. Uh, do you support training the police but not having more money? And she's like, absolutely. We're like, really? She's like, yeah, they don't need more money. You know, it was like all this stuff that you would never think Hillary Clinton would say. She said it. And then the meeting ends and we're like, can we get the links? And they send us back the most edited links. It was like the meeting was only 25 minutes. Like, what did you edit? You know, like, I know you edited this because the clip is nine minutes and I was in the room for 25. And they're just like, yeah, we can't put that out. And you're like, this is why people hate you guys, right? Because you agreed to it. She didn't even say anything wild, and you just like wouldn't do it. You know, it was like, that was our Bernie round one was interesting because Bernie was like, all what, no how. So he's like, free everybody from jail. You're like, Bernie, <laughs> not everybody is in federal prison. So, you know, to hear that tweet that's like, I'm going to free a million people from prison. You're like, not a million people in federal prison, Bernie. And he's like, oh, my bad. And you're like, okay. Uh, so, <laughs> but it was like a lot of that. It was a lot of like, it was the right thing. And then you're like, how are you going to do that? And he's like, <laughs> and you're like, so we literally, we're in the room with him and we say, um, he's like, Duray, I believe in a job as well that's going to give like 40 million jobs. You're like, cool. And we're like, well, how do you know the jobs will go to poor people and people of color? Mm -hmm. And he goes, because it's more of them. And you're like, well, I wish that that's how it were. You're like, that is, that'd be beautiful. It'd be because it was more poor people, they disproportionately got access to resources. Like, that's not how the government works. And he's like, well, what do you propose? And we're like, I don't know, Bernie, you've been in the Senate as long as I've been alive. What do you propose? You know, it's like one of those, like, <laughs> so that was a little rough. Uh, and that meeting ended with him being like, did I, it was five, six of us in that room. And he's like, did I earn your vote today? And Netta, Netta was my partner who I was with all the time in the protest. She looks at him and she goes, no, not today. <laughs> he was like, okay. Uh, this go round has been interesting. So Kamala is, what's interesting about Kamala is that Kamala, we met Kamala. Can you explain Kamala Harris to Kamala Harris is mind? running for president. She is um, the attorney general. She's the, she is a senator now, but she was attorney general of California. Uh, and she was a prosecutor, this is what she's done forever, blah, blah, blah. The thing about Kamala is that she is much better in person than people give her credit for. Like, reporters don't like her. They think she's really combative, like, really defensive. She was fine with us, like, on all the issues. The thing that is hard about her is that she just doesn't have any plans, right? So you go to our website, it's like she's just a handful of plans. It's like, you know criminal justice well. It's sort of weird that you don't have a criminal justice plan like that. It's sort of weird. It sort of feels like she's trying to be a centrist as long as she can before she has to commit to things. I like Pete. Mayor Pete is gay. Mayor Pete is young. Uh, Mayor Pete's from South Bend, like a small town. The hard thing about Pete is that, do you know what Pete is polling at with black people? No. Zero percent. We didn't even know you could still be a presidential candidate at zero percent. You know, like, that's like a fascinating sort of thing. So that has been an interesting, uh, to see Pete survive. Uh, Bernie's Bernie. Um, but then there's Elizabeth Warren, love who is Warren. like a strong... Got a plan for everything. We like Warren. Warren's really good. Her criminal justice stuff is a little shaky. She's just holding about private prisons, and you're like, Liz, not a lot of people in private prisons, but we like Warren. And then uh, Castro, we like Castro. He's a, a, a good policing plan. And Cory Booker, I love Cory. We're hoping Corey picks up some steam. Uh, and this next debate will only be 10 people and not 20. So that is a net positive for everybody. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yo, it won't be fatigued. Right. Uh, who do you have the most confidence in right now? Oh, I don't know. I'm ready for Marianne Williamson to go. I'm ready for uh, Andrew Yang to go. Um, to go? As in to get off that, like, to yeah. be out. It's 20 okay. people. We don't need 20 people, you know? We yeah. got to beat Trump. I get you. I get you. <laughs> uh, can we, like, kind of pivot over to where people like Beyonce fit in this picture? Like, because she gets mentioned so much in when people refer to you and to the status that you've gained from the Black Lives Matter movement, but it's not necessarily 
reflective of the work, but how does she fit into, into the picture? She gets reference less, thank God. You know, it's funny, she, Beyonce follows me on Twitter, and I know Beyonce, and when she followed me, literally, like, the next two months, everything I did, they'd be like, and this is Doreen McKesson, one of the nine people Beyonce follows. You're like, <laughs> no, you're like I didn't even like know that was like an intro bio. You're like, okay. Uh, <laughs> I think that the thing is that there are a lot of celebrities who are trying to figure out how to use their platforms for good. She is one of them. She called me during the Baltimore protests. Uh, you know, in Florida, for, exa for example, there are 1.2 million people that got the right to vote back, ex-felons. So when you become a felon in Florida, you used to permanently lose the right to vote. And if I had to ask you what is a felony, most of you would say like rape, murder, arson. But in Florida, theft over $300 is a felony. So. It's wild. So, you know, you steal a bike at 18 and permanently lose the right to vote forever. Those people just got the right to vote back January 1st of this year. Uh, in Florida, to this day, when you become a felon, you permanently lose the right to ever run for public office still to this day. So they needed 700,000 signatures to get this on the ballot so people could vote for it, to overturn it. And, like, I called Katy Perry, Lady Gaga. We called Vic Mensa and Jay. They opened up their concert halls and let the petition gatherers, like, go to the concerts and gather all these signatures. And, like, that is one of the interesting ways that we try to use celebrities to, like, do meaningful work, you know? Because what was cool about all of them, and I, I will never forget, when we did, when, when I called Gaga, she was like, I'll do it, da-da-da. And the venue pushed really hard against it, and Gaga oh. herself was like, I'm not coming if we don't, you know. She really did use her power to say, like, I believe in this. They are coming to gather signatures. She texted me. She's like, can I go get the signatures? And I'm like, ah, I think you might be a distraction. Uh, but <laughs> please shout them out from the stage, you know. But it was like one of those things where, like, you saw people use their power for good. Amazing, amazing. One other part of the book that I really love is about talking about history and how we tell history and the people that get left behind in the storytelling. You have a very interesting story around people preferring the story of Rosa Parks over another black woman who was very, very powerful in the movement. Yeah, Claudette Colvin. So she was, Claudette Colvin was young. Uh, she wasn't as polished as Rosa Parks. She was the first person to defy the Montgomery bus company, but like people just forgot about her because Rosa was just a better story. So in this chapter, I talk about like the people that we are willing to sacrifice for the better narrative. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't sacrifice people to, to tell stories. Like we should tell the truth. Also, when people think about the Montgomery bus boycotts, which lasted for 385 days, huge deal, they often think about Dr. King, and King was instrumental in keeping the boycotts alive. But there was a professor who actually started the boycott. She saw that this was the right moment. She literally goes to the colleges she taught at. She prints out 50,000 flyers back in the 60s and then goes to a high school and like works with kids and passes them out. And that was how the bus boycott started. And the, the reason we tell those stories is that the way we tell stories impacts the lessons we learn. And that like the lesson from that is like you actually have the power to do something that changes history. But if the only story we tell is like King came, then people feel like they need to like be a Dr. King to do something meaningful. And really it was like a random professor who was an organizer that had an idea that changed everything. Mm, mm, mm. Can we move on to um, the work of self-love? Because recently I've been noticing on Instagram, you're talking about embracing yourself a lot more. Yeah. I can imagine this is heaps of work. You've also mentioned on the podcast, like you spend a lot of time owing other people lots and you've only recently discovered that you should be owing yourself yeah. some time. How are you doing that? How are you working through that? I try to spend a lot of time with my friends and people I love. I was sad that I missed uh, my sister's first day of school. I mean, she's a principal, so she's not like a child. Uh, <laughs> but I was like, I want to be there to raise. So I'm going to go later. So I'm trying to, I, I feel like I spent five years with strangers because of the protests. Like I was either in the street, I was like sleeping in driveway. I mean, it was nuts. Like the stuff that we did was really wild. And now five years later, I'm trying to figure out like how I spend more time with like my friends and people I love, you know? Yeah, yeah. And Instagram is interesting because people, people get upset that I don't put more about the movement on Instagram. And it's like, I just need one space on the internet that is not about death that I spend so much time dealing with issues of death. Like the police are killing people, like all this stuff is focused on death. And Instagram to me, my Instagram, you would think it was like the perfect world. I'm like, everything's great, this is so amazing. <laughs> just because I need one digital space that just isn't mired in that, you know? I feel you, yeah, yeah. Um, there is a part of the book where you talk about your identity and it really moved me, it moved me to tears. I thought it was very, very beautiful. Is it okay that you read yeah. out this excerpt here about this your one? love? Love, yes, yes, that one. Uh, I refuse to apologize. So this is called um, 
coming out of the quiet, and it's a chapter about me being gay, and it started because I tweeted during the protest, like I never was in the closet, I was in the quiet, just because you didn't know doesn't mean it wasn't real. Um, so I refuse to apologize for the timbre of my voice, the sway of my gait, the gender of my love. I didn't always have the strength to refuse, but the lessons came slowly like the wave on a beach, slowly but surely, and then all at once. It was in the safety of my first kiss that I learned that men's bodies could do more than break me. It was in the gentle power of the last man I loved that I learned that the words of men could find parts of me to build, parts of me to love that I had not always seen as worthwhile or valuable. It was in holding hands, watching TV, and making meals with the small set of men who have ever professed their love, a love that I embraced, believed, and gave back, that I understood the beauty and the mundane parts of love, in the simple quiet, in the hellos and goodbyes, the kisses on foreheads and, instead of lips, in the post-it notes and voicemails. I had to learn all of these things in real life because I never saw them in the imagined worlds of TV or movies or cartoons. It was work to learn a love that made me less an object of desire and more a partner in a shared space. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to head to questions very, very soon. So, um, and there's a microphone just over there where the number one is, and there's a microphone over there too. So, if you do have any questions, please line up now so we can save some time. Um, I guess one of the last questions I wanted to ask you was. Um, Recently, you had a meetup in Los Angeles with um, some of the key players of the World, the World Cup Soccer Championship team, the yeah. US team. There was Chica, the rapper, the queer rapper. What sort of things did you talk about? So that, Megan, uh, Megan, who is one of the stars, she, Megan has pink hair, you probably know Megan because she's a star soccer player. And Megan, what's interesting, I know nothing about sports, so I know, like Colin Kaepernick is a friend, I have watched probably two football games in my life. Uh, and I know Megan. Megan reached out to me a couple years ago during the protest just to be like, I'm a supporter. So I knew, I like knew who she was. And then I see her on TV, I'm like, that's the soccer player. Uh, <laughs> is that that dinner was, or that lunch was a brunch, was us talking about like what are our commitments? You know, I think that now that the season has ended for them in some ways, they are trying to figure out like how they can do good in the world, you know? Okay. And that is most of the work with celebrities. It's like always pushing them to think about like how can they use their celebrity to amplify an issue? Uh, and there's this belief that like all the bad people already know each other, right? So part of our work is to make sure all the good people know each other. So like with Megan, Megan lives in Seattle. And I was like, Megan, do you know Macklemore? Because Macklemore is a good guy. So I'm like, so I'm like connecting them on DM, being like, hope you guys hang out in Seattle and do some good work, you know, because uh, Macklemore does all the stuff on addiction and you know, like Megan's great. So it's like, how do we like put people in spaces? Because you'd be surprised, most of the celebrities, like they either don't know each other or they are like each other's fans, you know, like they are. So I was at this, this is random, and I'll probably get in trouble for this story, but I was at this party, um, and B was there, and I say to her, I'm like, I ask her, does she watch Game of Thrones? And she does watch Game of Thrones. And she's like, DeRay, Daenerys came to my party. And I'm like, Beyonce, everybody you invited came to your party. You know, like, of course, like everybody, of course everybody came to your party. Um, but Amelia Clark, she did an interview later where she talks about meeting her. And this is funny, I've seen it happen. People literally walk up to B and they just freeze. They like, they're like, hello, my name is, and then they're like. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Amelia says she cried. And you're like, that is so intense. Um, so some of, some of them are actually like nervous around each other, right? right? So because I'm not one of them, I can just be like, hey, do you know so-and-so? And they're like, oh, and, and like we try to connect them with each other. The master connector. Try. Love it, love it. Okay, I think the questioners are all here. Hello, yes. Hello. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts about the whole Colin Kaepernick and this, I mean, no, aside I mean, <laughs> with what's, I mean, I guess what's happened with him um, and, you know, standing up for, for against p police brutality, but this whole side bit of Jay-Z now making that connection with the NFL away from kind of Colin and what, what <laughs> thoughts you have about that. And should they even be linked? Should Jay-Z just you know, kind of care about it. She tried to get me in trouble. Uh, <laughs> I dodged the question. I know, I'm like, nobody asked me about this. You know, it, this NFL thing makes no sense. It doesn't. And Jay-Z is an incredible rapper. <laughs> he is, he is an incredible rapper. A gifted rapper. This NFL thing doesn't, 
it just, I don't get it. You know, it doesn't make sense. And it didn't, you know, at the beginning, people were like, well, wait till you get more information. And I have been relatively quiet about it in public. But I get all these calls. So I get calls from people being like, DeRay, I got a text the other day being like, DeRay, my sister works at the NFL. You don't know all the details. Okay, cool. I'm getting all these texts from people being like, you know, there's another side. So I'm like, okay, I'm waiting for another side. Then it's like, well, the clothing line comes out. And you're like, the clothes are not going to change the game. That's not it. Like, that's not it. It just, so I don't know. This is, I don't think there's a smoking gun. I think that, I think that something that happens around like the, like the billionaire folks is that they all sort of hang out together and forget sometimes that like that is not the world for the rest of everybody. And I could see somebody selling this story about like, we're going to bring change to the NFL. But it's like, even the clothes, you think about it, the racist white people who hate Colin, they're not buying the Jay-Z shirt anyway. You know, like they're not, they hate Jay-Z. Like they, you know, so I don't know. This is hard. I, Colin, I love Colin. I believe in uh, Colin's work. I think it was a big risk for him to talk about the police. What is always shocking to me about the way people respond to Colin is that Colin didn't even say anything like intense. Colin was literally like the police are killing people. That's not like a, it's not like a new, you know, it's not like a new fact. That's not like a contra that like is happening, you know. And you would have thought that he was out here saying blow up buildings, you know. I think that was also what was hard about Jay Z's statement is that he sort of suggested that the field isn't where you do this stuff, you know. And if somebody ever told Jay-Z that, like, you don't rap about certain topics, he would be like, that is, un that is like, unreal that you would say that to him, you know? So I don't know. So this is um, hard, and I will probably never answer this question in the United States. So it's great to answer here. <laughs> <laughs> I just um, wondered, today if you could comment on the conviction of Muhammad Noor. And what your thoughts about that were, and how the police how officer, the, the police officer who and, um, yes. shot the white Australian. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's a, the 99% of officers who kill people, nothing happens to them. So we were shocked that something even happened to them. And I do think that it being a white woman under those circumstances just heightened the heighten the issue in that same place, whereas Philando Castile, the officer who killed Philando Castile, same geographic area, nothing happened to him, right? So I think that race definitely played a factor into how uh, Noor was convicted in the first place. Uh, and it's a reminder that more accountability will change the outcomes, you know? That like, if officers know if they do these things, there will be, an out there will be some sort of accountability, they'll make different decisions, uh, and Noor was one of a handful, like one of three or four officers where there was any sense of accountability that happened. And most places across the country, even if you get fired, you, because we don't, all the, there are 18,000 police departments and they're all independent. So if you get fired from one, you can just go to the next town and work there. And that's how it happens all across the country. So this was a shocking, like we were, it was a good thing that he got convicted. Uh, all too rare though. Hi, Terry. Thank you so much for coming. It was a great moment. I have a question regarding if there's like a global movement in terms of Black Lives Matter, because I follow uh, the Black Lives Matter um, on Twitter. And also, because I'm originally from France, I follow also what's happening in France in terms of everything that has to do with Black people. I follow activists in uh, Great Britain as well. And there is like this, almost like this consensus that is that there is this anti-black movement happening a lot. And I was wondering if you um, connect with other activists from whether it's Great Britain or whether it's like all other countries in Europe to talk and to have maybe like um, a common, um, I don't know, strategy or like do you exchange on the way racism is lived in different parts of the world or all these kind of things? So we do talk to people, and every time I travel, I, I meet with activists like wherever I can. I think, you know, I didn't travel outside the country for the first three or three-ish years of the protest because it's such an American thing to do to travel across the world, tell people how to do something you didn't do, you know? <laughs> and we haven't stopped the problem. Like, the police are killing people. So people are like, DeRay, how do I fix that? I'm like, I don't know, because we didn't fix it at home, right? <laughs> but because people like know us, they like think we, you know, and it's such an American thing to travel to somebody else's place and be like, this is what you do about the police. It's like, we didn't do it at home. So I'm mindful that in most of the places I'm learning as much about what to do as they are expecting me to teach them, you know? Like we know, what we did really well was like tell the story that changed the way people thought about it. We did that. And I can t tell people about that all the time. 
Uh, but I'm really worried about like, you know, because some places the border police are, I mean, now the border police, because Trump is wild, the border police are a huge problem. But in some places, the border police are where all the police violence is, not like the police inside. Whereas we are having like the police inside, the border police. Uh, so yeah, I do travel, but I'm like mindful that we haven't figured it out yet. And you know, ICE, the work on immigration is something that is a big solidarity point across the world right now because Trump is just so intense. And do you know how many people, do you know either one of you how many people ICE detains a day? ICE is the immigration, the immigration police. I forget how many a day, it's a lot. It's a lot. 55,000 people a day are detained by the immigration police alone. Uh, it is the most that ICE has ever detained in the history of ICE. ICE doesn't own enough property to detain that many people, which is why you, if you ever saw the kids in cages, part of the reason why they built the cages is that they're literally, they don't own enough property to detain that many people. And so they, uh, they actually rent out local prisons and jails. So say there's like the Sydney prison and there's like a wing that nobody's in, the government just like rents out the wing, which is wild. So we, there's solidarity around, like the immigration work is actually, I think, made the most like concrete solidarity. There's solidarity around like the idea of blackness, right? And like the fight against anti-blackness, but yeah. We've got some questions over here. We've got three minutes left, so hopefully we can get through them quite quickly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Try to be quick. Um, hi, Jay uh, Dore from a, um, a fellow year six maths teacher. I just want to say, good <laughs> work. Um, uh, just wanted to ask, when you talk about uh, consequences for the police, um, which obviously we need, but um, you're also, you know, talking about we shouldn't be putting people in prison. Um, you know, obviously you're saying they can lose their jobs, but it doesn't kind of translate and convictions are good, but what do you see as an appropriate consequence for a police who kill someone or do horrible things in their line of work? Um, what would, what, have, you, have you kind of talked about that with uh, people or...? Yeah, this might be one where I'm willing to fudge the abolition thing. Um, I'm kidding. But I think, um, I think losing the job and never being able to work in any part of that profession is actually a huge deal. And we just don't, that's not a thing. So it doesn't matter if you get, again, you can get fired in Baltimore and then go work in D.C. as a police officer. And that is just not a, that is no, that is essentially no consequence. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? We've had a similar thing with uh, Catholic priests here. So. Oh, I can't. Yeah. His mic. Sorry. <laughs> What'd you say? I was saying we heard a similar thing in Australia with Catholic priests um, and right. the problems they've been having. Right. <laughs> like you being able to move is not a. That's not a win. Yes. That's not a win. So I think that that actually would be huge. I think that like. Uh, some people talk about uh, disarming the police as like a win, and I think if you do bad, then like taking your weapon is sort of interesting. I used to be the, human, the chief of human capital. I used to run human resources for the school system in Baltimore, and we would take the, take the guns of officers all the time. They still had the power of being officers. You know, they still could arrest you. Most people thought they had a gun anyway, so like the thought of a gun didn't change. Like you were nervous for your life just because they walked up, and you just thought you couldn't see the gun even though we had taken it, you know? So like the impact is actually still the same in so many places, uh, but not being ever to work again is a huge deal, like in that mm -hmm. profession. Mm -hmm. We've got time for just, I'm gonna squeeze in one more question from Sis over here, hey. Hi, um, my name is Danielle. I'm originally from the States, and I'm- Where? From, uh, Boston. Okay, racist spot. Boston yeah. is a hard oh, place. <laughs> okay. uh, well, yeah, but um, I uh, recently, a lot of like shootings have been going on and I remember the day after the El Paso shooting, like I was prepping to come here to study abroad and I was with my dad in Walmart and I was just like petrified that like Whoa. something was gonna happen to me. So um, I was wondering like, do you, what are your thoughts on like the like shootings that are going on? Like literally I was reading an article, one just happened in Texas. two yesterday. Oh, two, I didn't yeah. even know about another one. Um, but uh, what are your thoughts and like how do you see that like intersecting with your work? One of the interesting things about poverty is that people, people at once are like, the poor people are uncivilized, can't do anything, aren't very smart. And then they're like, they literally participate in a logic that's like the poor people are building guns in their backyards. And you're like, people are not, like the guns did not come from the hood. There's no gun plant in like anybody's hood, right? So what we always remind people is that like, we get, we get really nervous about gun control that will lead to more penalties for gun owners because we think that that will actually just like bite black people in the, in the behind in the end, that we'll get all these wins on drugs and then like we'll just put everybody in jail for owning a gun, like that, we were worried about that. So when I think about gun control that makes sense, it is like manufacturers, it's like nobody needs a gun that has, shoots 50 rounds and 
30 seconds. It's like nobody needs that. I think what's interesting about gun control at the federal level is that part of what the NRA has done really well is that they, there's legislation that you probably know uh, that bans the federal government from ever studying the health impacts of gun control or like gun violence. Like the government literally cannot put out a report about gun violence uh, by law. And it's those sort of things that are like brilliant strategically, but like maniacally brilliant, right? And I think that part of our work is to push on that, is that the country is all about gun control. What'll be interesting, because there's a shooting in Texas yesterday, I think two shootings, is uh, there was a big shooting not too long ago, and Governor Abbott, who's the governor of Texas, super Republican, is that he has now had to offer thoughts and prayers like a couple times, right? And at a point, it's gonna be like, Abbott. <laughs> like, it's a lot of shootings. And what's really wild is that I think on Monday, on Monday, on Monday, law is going to affect, oh no, on September 1st, because I forget that I'm in the future here. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> and on September 1st, so tomorrow at home, there's a set of laws that go into effect in Texas that actually make we more weapons and more available. So there are, oh so like um, brass knuckles, all these things become legal tomorrow in Texas. And it is this really interesting thing where like we will see like what happens now that like weapons are being, like more weapons are being okay as violence is increasing and like what happens to all the people who voted for those things, you know? Goodness, okay. We have to end there. Thank you so much for your time, DeRay. Book signing. Hey? Book signing. Yes. Everybody. Thank you. DeRay will be signing copies of his book on the other side of freedom outside. Make sure you uh, get a signed copy. Thank you so much.